Atlantic Council's Scowcroft Center for Strategy and Security, this is NATO 20 2020, a new podcast series pitching fresh ideas for the world's oldest military alliance. I'm your host, Terry Schultz. I'm a freelance journalist in Brussels, and I've covered NATO for more than a decade, so I know a lot about how it's been doing things. But this podcast is going to be about how it could be doing things differently. For its NATO 20 2020 initiative, the Atlantic Council commissioned a series of 20 recommendations as to how the 70-year-old alliance could freshen up a bit heading into the next decade. Some of these papers are circulating ideas that are brand new, some we've heard before, but all of them are aimed at making the alliance stronger and more resilient to the threats that definitely do get more creative all the time. So I'm going to be digging into those ideas with their authors one episode at a time. This week, the recommendation to rethink and replace 2%. The authors, Derek Chalet, the Executive Vice President and Senior Advisor for Security and Defense Policy at the German Marshall Fund. Stephen Kyle, a Security and Defense Policy Fellow, also at GMF. And Chris Skaluba, the Director of the Transatlantic Security Initiative at the Atlantic Council. Thank you all so much for joining me. Now, first of all, I'm going to explain the 2% because if Americans have heard anything about it, they're probably confused. And that's because of President Trump's obsession with the 2%. Sometimes he seems to think that this means that countries need to pay 2% of their GDP directly to the United States. Sometimes he seems to say they should be paying it directly to NATO. And of course, neither of those things are true. What the 2% is, is a pledge made at the Wales NATO summit of 2014 that countries would start to begin to possibly maybe someday spend 2% of their GDP on their own militaries, which would make a stronger NATO. And of course, would be more fair to the countries that do spend 2% or more on their militaries and therefore, of course, can carry a heavier share of the burden. But it has been controversial since the beginning, as we'll discuss, because even at the time, everyone knew that this was probably never going to happen. The very language of the pledge aimed to move towards uh, is already doesn't give much confidence. And you, you guys who wrote this paper even called it to move towards. You forgot to say to aim to, to make it even softer. So let's start there. Now, Derek, you argue in your paper that it's time to drop the 2%, that it hasn't worked. And so it's simply ineffective. I, I mean, does that, does that give anyone confidence that NATO is strong and powerful and everyone's ready to, to pull their weight? Well, Terry, first, thanks for doing this uh, uh, podcast, uh, and and really congratulations to the Atlantic Council and to uh, Chris Skaluba and uh, his colleagues there, uh, not only for for working with Stephen and I on on this small part of the of the overall project, but for shepherding what is really an extraordinary uh, piece of intellectual and policy work, thinking about the future of the Transatlantic Security Alliance and and the way forward in. What is undoubtedly will be a pivotal year coming up here in 2021. So uh, I really want to commend the Atlantic Council for for initiating this, and you know, hopefully the piece that Chris and Stephen and I co-authored can help add to the debate a bit and try to try to get people thinking. Um, but from my perspective, this really goes back to the Whale Summit in 2014. I was there then, serving in the Pentagon with Chris, uh, and we were in many ways present at the creation. Uh, and what we wanted to try to do with this piece was was really take a constructive yet critical look at the two percent uh, debate metric for for uh, contributions to the NATO alliance. Because Terry, as you said, there's been so much attention paid to the two percent over the last several years. Um, and it, in part, to, we wanted to, to tell talk to readers about why we got here, how the two percent came to be, and, and what the logic was behind it. Uh, make a case for how it's made some good. So we I, we don't quite say that this has been a total failure. You know that it's been a it's a, been a face plant of a policy, uh, but that there's been some uh, progress made. There's unquestionably there are more NATO countries today spending above two percent of their GDP on defense than there were uh, in 2014, six years ago, when the Wales Summit uh, uh, first enshrined this pledge. But nevertheless, our judgment was that it is it has basically outlived its shelf life uh, as a as a kind of center point of the debate about the NATO alliance and what what a what a good contribution is to the NATO alliance. And it's actually becoming somewhat of a detriment to a con 
constructive conversation about what a, a responsible alliance member should do and, and should spend on their defense and should think about defense procurement and modernization. Uh, so rather than become a particularly useful tool to help alliance members uh, make the, make good decisions on their defense that would contribute to uh, broader alliance security and the greater good of the alliance, it's actually become something that's become somewhat of a hindrance. And so what we wanted to try to do is unpack the 2%, both to explain to people what it is and why we got here, also talk a little bit about its shortcomings, uh, and then to try to suggest a way forward. But Chris, uh, uh, again, was someone by my side uh, at the Pentagon when we worked on NATO issues. And I have to say, even then, we understood that the 2% was an imperfect metric to use. And that, uh, you know, there were concerns at the time uh, when this when this became enshrined in, in uh, NATO policy that situation we ended in, which is, you know, it, came, it became all about this pretty simplistic debate about whether a country is spending 2% of GDP or not. We knew that I, that was an imperfect metric. Nevertheless, we thought, you know, it was better than nothing at the time. And, and I think that I don't regret that, that the U.S. and other alliance members led the fight to make two percent uh, the 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 standard, the kind of good housekeeping seal of of what responsible alliance partnership look like. But nevertheless, I think uh, we've, we've reached a point where we need to to rethink that. But Chris, I want to draw you into the conversation here about both, also because I think the important part of the history of how we got to this point, and also mention that the two percent is not the only metric by which a country's contribution is measured. If you could explain that a little bit, Chris. That's right. Uh, and, and thanks, Derek. And thanks, thanks for the words <clears throat> on the volume. Yeah, I mean, when, when we were doing this back in 2014, it was coming off a decade where 2% kind of organically took off as a metric. But as we point out in the essay, it, what, it, was, it was like almost anti-NATO uh, in that it was so slapdash, right? It was the international staff looking up one day in the early 2000 and saying, okay, half the alliance is spending below 2%, half of it above, this is a good measure. Uh, it, it wasn't given the same kind of rigor that you expect from an institution or organization like NATO that is so thoughtful and so careful about most of the things that it does. Um, and then because of political pressures in the US, right, this, this started in the Bush administration uh, and, then, and then into the Obama administration, where disparities between what the U.S. was spending on defense post 9-11 and what European uh, allies were spending was, was, was just so out of whack that we had to do something. And so that is the, the context in which Wales came about. Um, you also have to remember in the U.S. government at the time, we were coming off the financial crisis. The, the U.S. was struggling economically to a degree. There was a belief that, you know, we could push some of that burden onto our allies and partners, you know, um, or, or we hope that we could. Uh, so, so part of 2% was asking allies and partners to do more so the U.S. could potentially do a little bit less. Um, the timing of this obviously wasn't ideal with uh, Crimea and the ISIS crisis that unfolded almost immediately afterwards. And so that's part of the history here. Uh, that, that's important to remember as well. And, and maybe, Stephen, maybe you could explain a little bit about about the, the way the U.S. spends money, this isn't entirely fair for the U.S. to look at its enormous defense expenditures and compare it with European countries who really do spend primarily on their own continental defense, except when they, of course, are contributing to U.S.-led you know, wars in Afghanistan. Um, can you explain that a little bit more about how the U.S. measures its defense spending versus how Germany, the, the President Trump's most frequent target, um, measures its own defense spending, how it looks at what it needs to defend. Yeah, certainly. And let me just start by saying uh, thank you um, as well for this opportunity. And thanks to Chris again for pulling me into this project. I mean, it's really been, I think, an engaging an engaging effort. And, and like Derek was saying before, the whole volume, I think, is just intellectually provocative and really gives folks a lot to, to chew on. So, um, I mean, I think on the point that you say, I mean, it's it does come off a bit disingenuous, I think, when we're comparing total U.S. defense spending with our European counterparts and we're considering um, spending within the alliance. I mean, you, you, you would actually have to think that the U.S. is a global actor on like most, if not all, of the European powers. Um, I mean, some are able to reach a bit beyond the region, but really they're, they're principally they're different types of actors. Um, and so you're, you're basically considering, you know, what we do in the Pacific theater, what we do 
in other hemispheres um, when we're considering our our percentage of spending when we're when we're talking about our European allies, we're really talking about the transatlantic theater. So it's been perpetually difficult um, to find out, you know, how much is actually spent in theater in, in Europe, I think, on the US defense budget. It's a hard figure to come up with, particularly because deterrence is kind of made up of a lot of things that are a bit amb ambiguous, like our nuclear strategic umbrella and some of the other things that we do. But I think that there, there's pretty sound logic behind the idea that, um, you know, it is not our entirety of our uh, defense spending um, that goes to the theater. In fact, it's it's probably quite a bit less. And so I think when we have those conversations about what we spend compared to European allies, um, we have to be at least a, a little bit um, more sincere with our own conversation about it. Um, and that's not to say that, that, that Europe doesn't benefit greatly, I think, from, from what the United States does there. It, it does, but I think it's just the conversation um, just needs to be a little bit more um, open-eyed about those things. And Derek, you, you said that, um, if I could just go back to something you said, you said that it, it was useful because it did bring up spending. I mean, um, do you think that that establishing this metric, which in some cases is counterproductive in Germany, for example, when you have President Trump hounding on, uh, you know, hounding Chancellor Merkel about it all the time, people don't want to spend more. Do you think that spending would have come up in national budgets in Europe if you didn't a have the metric and b have President Trump, you know, threatening to call them out, cut them off? all kinds of other things. I mean, that is the usefulness of it. Isn't yeah, it? I don't. So look, uh, uh, as I said, I don't regret the fact that in 2014, the US and other alliance leaders pushed to have the 2% enshrined as a broader policy. It's an interesting kind of uh, counterfactual question of whether absent the Crimea, the Ukraine war and the ISIS crisis that was exploding in the summer of 2014 when the NATO summit was happening, whether we would have had such a uh, easy time convincing allies that they needed to spend, uh, even make the two percent the goal, um, and and but the, the the dilemma we face, and this is the reason why at the time we pushed for two percent, and why I think it's had some utility since 2014, is that fundamentally this is a political issue, and that when we would sit around the table at NATO defense ministerials or even NATO foreign ministers would get together, everyone would be in, in violent agreement that they needed to spend more on defense. And there was, no, there was no real debate about that. The problem would be, however, is when these defense ministers would go back to their capitals and have to sit down with their prime ministers or their finance ministers and make the case for a higher defense budget. Um, now, this gets to a point I wanted to build on something that Stephen said, which is about the imperfection of the metric and kind of, frankly, the bit of the unfairness of the metric comparing the U.S. to some of our, our European colleagues. It's not simply that we're a global power with a, with a vast, ambitious global presence. Um, it's also that we can fund a lot of our defense budget through deficit spending. Uh, and... Some of our European partners, in particular, for example, the Germans, who have, by law, have to balance their budget every year, do not have the same luxury. So they have to confront the trade-offs more directly than we do in the United States. Because, And we've, we've done a lot of deficit spending over the last three or four years, uh, where we have not really had to confront some hard trade-offs. Now, I believe the next administration, whoever wins in November, is going to have to confront trade-offs more meaningfully because of the pressure on the budget, because of, of all of the resources that are gonna to have to go to COVID uh, recovery, our econo the economic crisis, um, there it will be an almost inevitable downward, it will be inevitable downward pressure on defense budget. So the trade-offs will be more, more clear. Finally, the other piece of the imperfection of the, of the metric is that, and we're seeing this right now as GDPs are going down because of the economic crisis, as defense spending holds flat, it looks like Germany's actually doing much better on, on its defense spending as a percentage of GDP than it was a year ago, simply because the GDP has gone down. So, Which is why your recommendation that output be measured instead of the input of, of strictly a budget. Absolutely. It's your kind of your classic uh, uh, failure of strategic planning where you measure by inputs, not outputs. Um, and the 2% is, is measurement by inputs. And if I could follow on, Terry, just quickly, you know, it's it, what Derek says about the political nature of this is, is really important, right? You'll still hear people uh, 
European colleagues in embassies in Washington saying, don't get rid of 2%. You know, it's, it's, the, it's the one thing I have to go back to my capital and say the U.S. really wants this to happen. Um, the problem is what we point out in the essay, the credibility that comes, uh, the credibility problem that comes from not the alliance not being able to do something that it so publicly said it was going to do, right? It's like, you know, if I went out and said, okay, we're going to talk about NATO 2% and I came on and talked about the NBA, you'd be looking at me like I was a little bit crazy. And so I think that's part of the issue. Um, the, the, the secondary issue um, is that it's eroding solidarity. And I think what nobody could have recognized in 2014 or predict with certainty in 2014 was the Trump presidency that he would take this issue, pervert it, and then weaponize it against the alliance in a way that nobody could have reasonably expected in, in 2014. Yeah, so that's why, Terry, I think it's important to note, I don't think that it's, it, it's inevitable we would have gotten to this point in terms of the 2%. I mean, look, eventually it would have probably, you know, diminished uh, uh, its effectiveness over time, I think, but it's the way that it has been weaponized and frankly, distorted over the last several years, as you said right at the outset, and in terms of the misunderstanding of what the 2% means, talking about it as though it's like dues you owe at a club of some kind, um, which is understandably, I think, probably thinks of it that way because that's really all he knows is club dues. Um, so, uh, you know, that's, that, and that, that's really accelerated the diminishment of the utility of the 2%. And that's why we think when we argue uh, that it's actually become a detriment to any sort of constructive progress on defense spending. So one of the arguments that I often hear here, and maybe Stephen, you could come in here and I hear it from people who know the issues well, like General Ben Hodges, is that uh, that countries like Germany would very much like to expand the definition of what could be considered a contribution to 2%. I mean, again, this is stretching what it was meant to be and, and you know, automatically sort of making it le less significant. Um, and that is that they would like to, you know, say cyber spending or, you know, if, if they're going to um, widen their bridges as part of military mobility or, or you know, it, things like this, they would like they would like to add some of these costs and say that that should be part of our 2%. Would that work, Stephen? Well, I think that the, the, the general idea is there's actually no standard definition, um, I think, which is one of the challenges of, of the metric itself. But I think as you start talking about this, I mean, you, you kind of have an open-ended conversation. So are we even talking about 2% anymore when we have some of these? I mean, maybe maybe it's more. Um, so I think you really have to kind of think about what you're talking talking about here. Um, but I actually think some of this is already happening. I mean, you mentioned cyber. I mean, critical cyber infrastructure is already part of this conversation in some countries and some NATO countries. And so um, I think one of the challenges is, and what we try to lay out is if we're going to have metrics like this, like let's count the same thing. Let's let's actually have a standardized definition of the thing we're counting because there are certain countries, part of the alliance that have been over the 2% mark for some time now. Um, and I mean, they're spending most of their money on pensions and personnel and not really creating real capability for the alliance. Um, and so uh, I think that's something that needs to be corrected, but, but whether or not that means we're talking 2% or, I mean, I know a few folks have said 3% or something like that. I mean, that's, that's another debate. I think one of the things we try to hint at though is like any, any metric that's simple in public will have some challenges too, right? Because it will be used kind of as a blunt instrument. Um, and so we also just really need to be mindful uh, uh, in the paper, it says specifically like in a perfect world, we'd be having these conversations behind closed doors and people would be doing what needs to be done because it's in their interest, right? And we wouldn't necessarily have arrived where we have. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I think that, that as far as expanding it, um, it's more about standardizing it and that could be expanded in, in how, NATO traditionally thinks about security and COVID-19. I mean, we haven't touched on it a ton, but health security is, is probably a part of that. NATO has been doing quite a bit there. So, so uh, we're trying to keep this, you know, uh, this podcast hip and we're told we can't go too long. Can't be real NATO nerds and, and drone on and on as I would tend to do because I have a million more questions for you. But let me try to try to sort of wrap this up. And we're, we want this to be not hindsight 2020, but foresight 2020. So each of you pick one of your recommendations to give our viewers and listeners about what is the most important of the recommendations you came up with your paper. Give each of you one chance. I mean, I can start um, if it's helpful. I mean, I think I think trying to emphasize trend lines um, rather than um, points in time, rather than headlines. 
just looking at the last three, three to six years, I mean, that from experience shows that that would be very valuable. I mean, um, some European allies have actually done quite a bit um, over the last few years. And it's almost shocking um, if you would think of what had happened the preceding years. So I think really trying to see where we were and where we've come and where we need to go. I mean, thinking about it that way is a little bit more useful than saying, are you meeting 2% now or are you not? So when Secretary General Stoltenberg puts up his graphs and shows that, you know, pre-2014, people were actually dipping and now it's constantly going up. I mean, he he does very much try to make use of that of, of that tool. Um, well, and, and if I can, I mean, just the fact that, I mean, Germany, I forget exactly what the figure is off the top of my head right now, but over 35 percent increase since 2014 in the defense budget. I mean, that's significant. Um, and how is that a good news story instead of being the story we get in, in this country about Germany? Yeah, that's true. Chris, what's, what's your what's your favorite recommendation here? You know, I, I think it's maybe the most controversial, um, but I think it's it's worth stating that, that we, we need to approach burden sharing with a sense of proportionality. Right. I think expecting the Croatians to do the same thing as the United States or the Albanians to do the same things as the Brits is, isn't, isn't fair. And that doesn't mean that as part of the club, they, they, they shouldn't be investing in, in hard military resources, but, but there's obvious limitations uh, and ceilings that are always going to be there. I do think that with the advent of cyber and the advent of hybrid, um, there are relatively uh, low cost uh, skills that are significantly valuable to the alliance that could be that could be counted uh, in a way than just the, the the number of dollars or euros put behind them. So so I think uh, you know a, a more thoughtful discussion about how to tier allies into types of uh, contributions makes a lot of sense to me. And and Terry, I'd uh, say building on that, it's it's. As Stephen said, standardizing our definition. Uh, so, so we're actually talking about the same thing. Uh, but then most importantly, switching our mindset from inputs to outputs. And, and you, you said, Terry, early on in the conversation that it's not just 2%. Of course, there's also a pledge that within the 2%, NATO, NATO allies will spend 20% of that on certain key uh, capability categories. And of course, those of us in the defense world have, have talked for years about how it, what really matters is the 20%, not the 2%. Uh, been able to win that argument. And I think what we're trying to appeal to here is perhaps that's why we need to retire the 2% and focus more on the outputs and, and what we're actually trying to achieve, keeping in mind, as Chris suggested, that we're not expecting uniformity across the alliance and we need to think it in more in terms of distinct uh, capabilities and, and unique assets. All right, all good ideas for looking forward. So for all of you who didn't get enough of this, you can find this full paper and all the rest of the 20 recommendations on the Atlantic Council website. That's atlanticcouncil.org under the NATO 20 2020 series. So thank you so much to Derek Chalet, Stephen Kyle, and Chris Scalua for telling us about their recommendation that NATO rethink and replace its 2% spending guideline. Thank you so much for joining us. I'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.